What is NVR? NVR means nonviolent resistance. It's an approach that we have developed to help parents and teachers deal with violent and self-destructive behavior by children and adolescents. The reason we found it necessary to develop this new approach was that usually in mental health, mental health services, psychotherapy, psychological approaches to children's problems, generally there were lots of difficulties in establishing a good treatment alliance with parents, to say nothing of teachers, among others because all of our thinking is very, very centered on the child. Okay, the question is always, what does the child need? And this is, of course, the central question in education. The problem is that parents and teachers will not be able to give the child what the child needs unless they, as parents and as teachers, also get what they need in order to be able to help the child get what the child needs. So we have to care also for the providers of help, of educational services, and not only for the receivers, that is, the, ch the children, for two reasons, okay? The providers must be capable of delivering those needs, and second, because the providers are persons in their own right. They come to us, therapists, mental health services, counselors, they come to us with difficulties. Okay, the child does this, the child is violent, the child is self-destructive, the child uh, uh, plays hooky at school, the child, uh, many, many difficulties, sometimes extreme. Okay, the child threatens suicide, the child hits his sister and humiliates her. And they come with those questions, very often burning questions, because the parents feel they have to react, they have to do nothing. And mental health providers, psychotherapists, are quite at a loss in helping them act under those circumstances. Okay? Almost all of the answers that we have are very slow in coming, and they may ask, but what do I do when the child okay, shuts himself in the toilet and threatens to kill himself or to burn the house? Okay? So they, they need to, re to react. They need to react and actually they will react because no reaction is also a reaction but it is the false reaction it is a reaction that transmits helplessness paralysis and makes the problem worse than it was for this reason parents have usually been quite forgotten by mental health services because we weren't willing to consider their needs as needs that are in the first line. But they are the ones that bring the children to therapy. They are the ones that are called by the school to deal with the child's problems. And then what do we do? We have, they are the clients, actually. Okay? The, the child is brought by them, the actual client, the ones who are doing the actual efforts are usually the parents. So I definitely think that in the world of mental health, parents have been treated pretty badly. Not only that they haven't received the help that they need in order to be able to react in those difficult situations, there's worse. Actually, they have also been systematically blamed for the problems of their children. The assumption was that if the child has problems, then necessarily the parents are to blame because they didn't rear them in a way that would prevent those problems. 
But that's not self-evident at all. Actually, this idea that the parents are to blame for the child's problems is very, very new. To get a measure of how this idea is not self-evident at all and was never thought to be true before, okay, let's say, the last 30, 40 years, consider the story of Pinocchio. Nobody would think that Geppetto was to blame for Pinocchio's problems. Okay? On the contrary, okay? Pinocchio's problems were caused by his own curiosity, his own drive, his own impulses, and because of negative impulse, negative company, okay? In negative influences of people that wanted to okay? take him into their own services, a situation that is extremely common also nowadays. So NVR was developed, nonviolent resistance was developed to help parents and teachers resist destructive and self-destructive behaviors by kids, by children of all ages, but in a way that is strictly nonviolent and also without escalation. That is NVR. I usually work with the parents alone, without the child. Sometimes, if the child is in therapy, then we always make it a point to get in touch with the child's therapist and try to develop a collaborative relationship. But we work with the parents. And nobody asks if it is right or wrong to work alone with the child, okay? Everybody thinks that if the child once agrees to be in therapy, he should be in therapy. We also think that the parents who experience very much the difficulties with the child have a right to have a help for themselves, to be at the center of attention. So we are actually balancing an imbalance that exists in the field because parents are usually not considered to be clients on their own right. If they are brought to, if they are part of the therapeutic process, then they are usually considered to be there in order to serve the needs of the child. We think that parents are clients on their own right, and only if we consider the parents as clients also on their own right can we create optimal conditions to help the child. Okay? That's our belief in this area. And actually, without considering the needs of parents, the fact that parents suffer, the fact that parents often are threatened, the fact that parents are many times helpless, the fact that parents sometimes are drawn into situations of escalation, we don't, if we don't consider those needs of parents, we'll lose the parents. We we'll lose them as clients, and they are fundamental for the therapeutic process. How do we know that without considering their, their needs as parents and as persons, if we don't do it, we'll lose them? Because of dropout rates. Thus, then, in research on parental guidance, the average dropout rate from the good projects on parental guidances that have been published is between 30 and 50 percent. That means that 30 to 50 percent of the parents drop out from the guidance, from the therapy process, before reaching its end, after the first session, second, third, or so forth. In our, pro in our project, we have already made many studies, the dropout rate is 5 percent in the average. So you can get an idea of the big difference in the ability to create a, an alliance with the parents when you consider their own needs. But the question is not only to show sympathy for the parents' plight, we also have to show them that there are things that they can do, that there's a clear direction of which they can go, and that it is a direction that they will accept. We have to give them the feeling, if you go in this direction, you will already be able to get out of passivity, to get out of impotence, 
to get out of the corner in which you were stuck. And for a while we looked for a way of engaging and mobilizing the parents. We wanted to have a simple message, something that they could keep in mind and that would be applicable in many situations. Simple and a clear direction. Now, simplicity and a clear direction do not usually characterize psychotherapy. We psychotherapists like complexity. Okay? We didn't come to the profession because we were looking for simple okay, and very practical interventions. We thought okay, that complexity is almost the stuff of our profession. However, with parents we do need a simple engaging message. Why? Because the parents are often caught up in situations in which they cannot make a very complex mental elaboration. They are urgent and demanding situations. Okay? When a child beats up his sister, attacks her, humiliates her, when a child threatens to commit suicide, when a child steals money from his parents, from his family, from other people, or when the parents are called because the police found that their daughter was drugged or completely drunk in some corner of the city. All of those situations demand a parental response. And in those situations, the parents cannot make all kinds of very complex psychological calculations because they are under tremendous emotional load. They have to react under tremendous emotional load. That's why we were looking for a simple message, easy to keep in mind and acceptable. And the first principle, the first message that we develop, and that's how we begin with parents, is the message of parental presence. This concept, parental presence, is like a, a like a compass showing a parental north. If you go in this direction, you'll already be doing something right. Afterwards, you can make small corrections, but this is the general reaction. And we define <coughs> parental presence in a very simple and intuitive way. Parental presence is the experience that the child gets when the parents behave in ways that convey the message, I am your parent, I am here, and I'll stay your parent, I'll remain your parent. You cannot divorce me, you cannot fire me, you cannot paralyze him. I'm here and I stay here. When the parents behave in ways that convey this message, the child feels that he or she has parents and not only a money machine or a provider of services, that there is somebody there, a person who is present. And what is no less important, also the parents feel that they are more there, that they have weight, that they fill up space, that they have some influence, that they are persons to be reckoned with. Social support is one of the major principles we work with. With every family that we work with, everyone, we always invariably help the parents to recruit to put together a group of supporters from the extended family, from their favorite friends, sometimes also somebody from the school staff, somebody who works with the child, sometimes a sports coach, sometimes a neighbor. And we do it practically, concretely. That means in every treatment we have one meeting, one session that is devoted to the supporters. All the supporters come once in the therapy Usually it is a longer session, an hour and a half, because it's more complicated. And usually the session is also the central session in the treatment. After the uh, support session, things are never the same. Because now, first of all, the problems have been taken out of their secrecy. They are not secret anymore. They are not hidden anymore. They are something that those supporters know about and in which the supporters are able to help 
to help the parents. And then the situation is not the same anymore because the parents now have wider shoulders. Okay? They are no longer alone on themselves, enclosed in their personal intimate bubble, but they can speak as a we, no longer only as an I. And the moment that they have those wider shoulders, they gain legitimacy and possibilities of influence. And also the child has possibilities of getting messages from people that it is not easy for the child to reject their messages because they're not his parents. Okay? It's easier to reject messages from parents than messages from an uncle that you like or a, a grandfather that is very close to you. It's more difficult to do that. So that's one of the reasons that you use a support system. And support is actually at the very center, at the very heart of the idea of nonviolent resistance. Much of our ideas are derived from nonviolent resistance as a social political movement, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and many others. And it is very clear in nonviolent resistance that you cannot have nonviolent resistance if you are alone. You cannot conduct nonviolent resistance as you are alone. If you are alone, you will either be driven to give in or to lash out, to strike back. You need support in order to be nonviolent and to resist together. So we use the support system also to prevent escalation, both to help the parents not to give in and not to lash back. That's why it is so crucial. The question regarding techniques. All of the principles that we have developed are illustrated by specific techniques. Thus, the idea of presence, of increasing, increasing parental presence, we have developed quite a series of measures to make the parents more present, to feel more presence, to show more presence, to persist in their presence, the same thing with teachers. Okay? We have a series of techniques for increasing teacher presence and the class and the courtyard, in front of the school, in the life of the child, even outside school, in the mind of the child to be more present. I'll give you a couple of ideas, a couple of examples. We have the sit-in. The sit-in is a technique, is a very specific procedure, that sometimes has become emblematic of nonviolent resistance. It's taken, the idea is taken directly from the work of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and uh, a sit-in uh, goes like that. Let's say the child has done something that is unacceptable, okay, an act of violence. The parents enter the child's room later in the day, not immediately. We have a principle, the principle of the lady, that says you should strike the iron when it is cold. Why? To prevent escalation. So later in the day or in the evening or even next day, the parents enter the child's room, preferably together, they sit down, they don't begin talking before they sit down because if you come into the child's room and you start talking standing, it's threatening, it's menacing, it's invasive. First, if you first sit down, you convey less threat and there's less risk of escalation. And then you say in a very quiet tone, we cannot accept anymore that you do so and so, okay? hitting your sister or uh, disappearing from house or stealing your brother's money. We cannot accept it anymore. We'll sit here with you and we'll wait until a suggestion develops here among us how this will stop. We'll try to understand what is happening to you, but this will have to stop. And then they wait in silence. The fact that they sit there and wait in silence, are willing to respond to anything that the child says, creates a different kind of interaction. They don't preach, they don't browbeat, they don't threaten, they don't say, if you do this again, we'll do so and so. No, they wait. And the interesting thing is that what helps here is not the suggestion that the child raises or does not raise. What helps here is the fact that the parents remain sitting sometimes for an hour, waiting for something to come up, 
giving just a little bit of encouragement, but not very much. They don't take charge of the suggestions that come up. Okay, they can examine them with the child. This creates a completely different kind of dialogue, of circumstances. If no solution arises, still the sitting can be very effective. The parents say to the child, we still haven't found a solution. We'll continue looking for one. And they leave the room. Okay, now, what is the factor of change here? Is the fact that the parents sit and endure. That is, they become present. They be, there's a mass of parental presence, of persistence. In time and through time, they convey decisiveness. So the sitting okay, is a technique, if you want, okay, a procedure, to increase the parents' manifestation of presence. After the sitting, the parents are changed. The child many times is puzzled, but the parents are changed. The moment that they feel that they can do that, that they are able to sit there for half an hour, an hour of time, without being drawn into an escalation, this fact is crucial for the change we are trying to bring about. Another technique which you use a lot is the telephone round. This is particularly for adolescents who disappear, who vanish, who lie about where they are, who say I'll come back at 9 and they come back at 12 o'clock at night, uh, who are already frequenting bad company. Okay, so parents are very helpless in this kind of situation. So we help parents to tell the adolescents, look, we are going to ask you now, since you have disappeared a few times and sometimes the things that you have told us were not exactly right, we are now going to ask you a few simple questions every time you, you go out. We'll ask you where you are going, with whom, what is the program, and we have to set up to agree upon a return time. So long as those simple points are kept, I won't intervene unless there are dangerous signs, but so long as those are kept, that will be enough. I'm not interested in controlling your life. Now, many times the child will agree. We know that 70% of the kids agree to give this information and also stick to it. If the parents insist and are willing to say, no, we have to know this is very little, it's very modest. But some children, some kids are already up to their necks in all kinds of problematic contexts and activities, so they won't agree to this. And sometimes they will say this openly to the parents, okay, we won't tell you that, it's, not you, it's none of your business. Now, we have a principle, when a child says to the parents, this is none of your business, this is the parent's business, okay, very obviously, okay, the parents, the child is trying to, sh to uh, get rid of the parents or the parental influence in an area which can be vital to the child's safety. Now say that the child goes out in spite of the fact that the parents oppose him and he didn't give the information that was requested. Then the parents do a telephone round. And the telephone round is something that they prepare. It is not something that you do spontaneously. You have to prepare for it. And we help the parents to prepare for it. The preparation is already a, a, a process that changes the parent's condition okay, in a very fundamental way. So the parents prepare for the uh, telephone round. And a telephone round consists between 10 to 15 telephone calls. They call the child's friends and they don't begin in the place where they think that the child is because they want to leave messages. So only the last one, only the last one or two will be those where the parent think the child is really possibly, probably really there. So they start with other friends, with other acquaintances. And they identify themselves, I'm the mother of uh, Johnny and I'm calling you because I'm very, very worried. Johnny said he would be back at 9 o'clock, now he's 11 and he hasn't come back. Maybe you know where Johnny is. And the friend will say he doesn't know and then the mad mother may call, may ask, uh, maybe you have an idea whom should I call. Sometimes the kids give other telephone numbers with names, which increases the parents' list. Simply they want to get rid of the parents who are on the phone. And then the parents finish this contact with the child, the friend of their son or daughter, with the million dollar question. What is the million dollar? I have a small, quite small favor to ask from you. 
A small favor is when you meet my son in school tomorrow, please tell him that we were very worried and we called you at your house because we were so worried. Please do it. Do these children convey the message as they do? We know that 50% of those kids tell our child that we called. Why? Maybe because uh, they simply want to pull their leg and say, ha ha, your mother called, your babysitter and so forth. Anyhow, what will happen is that our child will get five, six, seven messages. Each one of them is a message of parental presence that means I was here, I was here, I was here. There is more. In the preparation for the uh, telephone round, we also have to prepare the parents to withstand the child's attacks, attack on the next day without escalating. Because the child will surely come back the next day when he gets those messages with murder in his eyes. He will come back and say, what did you do? You destroyed my social life. And we have to prepare the parents to withstand this attack without escalating. And this preparation is very, very interesting process. Parents learn a lot. They role play one with the other. One plays the child, the other plays the, ch the parent. We role play the situation. They enjoy it usually very much. And actually, when they are attacked by the, pet, by the child, attack because the child is very, very angry, they surprise the child by not accepting his invitation to escalate. And they actually, after the parent, the child screams his anger at the parents and, and waits because he stops, he wants to hear the parents' response, he, has, he wants to listen to the, to, the, to the parents' agreement, to hear the parents' agreement, no, we won't do this anymore. And it's not, of course, what the parents say. The parents say, you know, we don't want to call anybody. We're not interested in calling your friends or talking to their parents because the parents talk to their parents too. We're not interested, and we won't do this if you answer those little questions and agree upon the, okay, the, the time to return. That's it, and then we won't. And the child sometimes, are you crazy? You go to a psychiatrist, you go to, you, you are, you, if you're crazy, what can I do? It's your problem, of course I won't give you all the things. Then the parents finish the conversation with a confession of positive impotence. They say, okay. If you don't tell us where you're going to be, and if you don't come at the appointed time, then we have no alternative, we have no choice. We cannot simply give you up, and we are not going to give you up. And then they finish the conversation. When parents are able to do this, they gained enormously. They gained in the level in which they can exercise a kind of presence that we call vigilant care, that means being able to know what's happening in the life of their child or to look closer at what is happening in the life of the child. These are very crucial. This kind of presence is crucial in the prevention of risk, of adolescent risk. is the crucial factor in the prevention of adolescent risk. So the parents raise their presence considerably and then withstand the attack and the escalation. And the change, again, in the parents is very profound. Children, of course, resist the attempt of the parents to resist their violence or their self-risk behaviors or their self-destructive behaviors. They resist because they have come to identify their own independence or their own pleasures with those activities and the parents are resisting them and suddenly are resisting them in manners that can be very, very effective. So it's quite natural for the child to resist that. But we know that inside the child's mind there are also voices that like what the parents are doing. We think that the child's mind is made out, is constituted of a kind of a parliament, a parliament of voices. We call this the parliament of the soul. And there are many parties, let's say, in this parliament of the soul. So in an adolescent's mind, there will be the party for drugs and the party for the gang and the party for all kinds of thrilling risk activities. But there will also be a smaller party that is presently weak or dormant, which is the party that says, doing this is not such a good idea. 
that's not the best way of living my life. I'm going to get into trouble. So this party is at present, when we start working with the parents, in a weaker or dormant position. When the parents start to develop, to increase their presence and manifest nonviolent resistance and include supporters in the process, those voices get strengthened. Those positive voices begin to mend, and we look with the parents at signs that the child protests and says, stop doing that. But on the other side, there are signs in his behaviors that they say, please don't stop, please continue. Okay, continue to do that. And we see that many, many times. There have been some changes and new concepts that have developed during the years because the model has become richer and richer. One of the concepts is the concept of the new authority. We have understood that nonviolent resistance when parents, when parents manifest nonviolent resistance and increase their presence without escalating, actually they are manifesting, they are developing a new kind of authority which is very different from the traditional authority that we were used to. Actually, the fundaments of this new authority are the opposite of the fundaments of that one-time traditional authority. In which sense, the authority of, past, of the past was based on distance. Okay? We believe that the authority person, in order to keep her authority, must be distance and must be looked up from below Okay, that's we've been a pedestal. We don't want to be distant parents. We don't want the teachers of our children to be distant. So we can't accept this anymore. That authority of your had the goal of creating obedient children. The goal of education was to think that the child should be obedient. We don't accept it anymore. We want our children to develop autonomy, initiative, all of us. So that this idea of obedience is not a positive value, particularly in conditional, unconditional obedience. It's not a positive value for us, so we reject it. That authority was also a very strict hierarchy. The person on the top didn't have to give reckoning on his or her doings to anybody else, be it a father or a mother or a teacher who cannot accept it anymore. We have seen many, many innumerable times that a person with authority if she is immune to critique, can abuse her own authority in awful ways, so we cannot accept it anymore. So there are many, okay, all the principles on which traditional authority okay, was based are no longer accepted. So we needed new principles. We needed to base authority on different principles. So instead of distance, we base authority on the side of presence, Instead of control and obedience, we base authority on self-control. Okay? The parents and the teachers show self-control in two senses. They don't react impulsively, they don't lose it, and in a positive sense, they act according to their responsibility. They say, this is my duty and I'll fulfill it, this is self-control. And then it is no longer such a strict hierarchy immune to critique, but on the contrary, the person in authority stops being a lonely commander and starts being legitimized and supported by the support group. But the support group not only legitimizes, creates also transparency. So the very intervention, the very fact that we involve support groups reduces the arbitrariness of power and reduces the potential damages of authority. Another new concept is the concept of vigilant care. Vigilant care is the attitude of parents that is mostly linked to the prevention of risks. Vigilant care is the attitude of being with a finger on the pulse, of caring about what the child does, of accompanying the child in his development. Now, once uh, we used to talk okay, in the literature about parental monitoring, parental monitoring has been shown to be a problematic concept because it is too strict. Okay? There was the assumption that the more monitoring, always the better. It is not so at all. 
Okay, the child needs also autonomous, an autonomous pace to develop well. The concept of vigilant care is much more graded than okay, the idea of parental monitoring. We talk about three levels of vigilant care. The level of open attention, it means when there are no signs of danger, the parents are only interest, interested in the child. They care for the child. They ask the child open questions because they care for the child. There is dialogue, but there is no attempt to check on what is happening. There's no monitoring, actual monitoring at this stage. The parents will stay on the stage most of the time. But when there are signs of danger, they raise the level of vigilant care one level, and now we have focused attention. Now they'll ask. Now we'll have those questions. Where are you going? With whom? What is the program? And so forth. Now the parents begin checking because there are signs of danger. They've de detected alarm signs in the child's behavior. And then there is a third level, the highest level of vigilant care, which is the level of unilateral action. When the parents find out that there are not only signs of alarm, that the child is already really stuck in a problematic situation, involved with drugs, frequenting the, 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 the delinquent group, uh, playing hooky from schools, day after day after day, all those things, or being uh, completely uh, enclosed up with the computer, all of those are situations of high developmental danger. Then the parents intervene by acting in order to uh, release the child, to save the child from the danger. And we have characterized all these three levels and always when the situation starts to become common, the parents reduce the level of involvement when the, okay, let's say, the basic level is always the level of open attention. So the ideal is always to be able to return to the level of open attention so that the intrusiveness okay, is not actually intrusive. They do only what they need in order to prevent danger. Okay, we have published quite a lot, quite a lot of studies on this, how uh, uh, vigilant care can help in preventing risks from small children to very big children. Okay, we have a whole project about young drivers, okay, young male drivers, because only the male drivers are dangerous, female danger drivers are not dangerous, they make only small accidents and the ones who are danger for life or themselves and others other male drivers, and we have done a study showing how vigilant care reduces driving danger okay, very, very significantly. Okay, the spread of NVR has been uh, very satisfactory. Today we have institutes uh, practicing and teaching NVR in, in many countries, in Europe particularly, and we have it in, in the German-speaking countries. That's where we began, uh, Germany, Switzerland and Austria, that we have many, 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 many groups practicing NVR. We have a considerable number of institutes already in Holland and Belgium. In France, we have some groups with particular interesting projects in Montpellier, in Paris. Uh, we have already uh, programs also in Italy, beginning to have problem, programs in Spain. So in England, okay, quite a few, quite a number of institutes uh, in England. Uh, the scope of our activities is becoming wider. One of my students, Eli Leibovic, at Yale University, and he has done the adaptation of the approach to anxiety disorders. We have published quite a lot of articles and also a treatment manual of anxiety disorders. And, of course, the most important widening of the approach is the world of the school and teachers. I have just published a book Okay, devoted to teachers. It is already in the process of being translated into German and into uh, Flemish, Dutch. I hope it will be published also in English in next year. Okay, this is a popular book because we want to 
uh, to get to the teachers. So if we succeed in coming across with this book, we'll be able also to break the frontiers and getting over, getting across also to, to the United States and 